Psalm 2. And let's bring praise to our Lord. Amen. Everybody there? Uh, yes. Okay. Psalm 2. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them, and he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son, that he not become angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all those who take refuge in him. Let's take refuge in him. Amen. Thank you, Lord, Amen. for your word. Thank you, Lord, that you have introduced us to your anointed, to your king, to your son in this psalm, and that it offers hope. And... Uh, and it also shows that there's going to be judgment. Lord, we know that this is soon to come upon us. The signs are getting clearer and clearer each day. And we long, we, we just long for, uh, to be in your presence, Lord. We, we long for you to return to earth and uh, take us to heaven with you. Mm. And mm -hmm. uh, look forward to the glories of heaven. And we pray for those who still don't know you yet, Lord that you may draw them close to you through your Holy Spirit and through the witness of your body, your believers. So, Lord, be with us this day. We offer you our praise and worship in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, thanks, my brother. We are in... 1 Corinthians chapter 14, so if you want to make your way there now from Psalms. And um, so just so you know kind of where we're headed uh, in, uh, uh, let's see, we probably have, a, after today we have three more probably uh, services in the book of First Corinthians, and then we're going to take a break in between First Corinthians, Second Corinthians, and Brother Carl is going to um, do some biblical prophecy updates and where we are and what's going on. So he'll be doing a, a series on that, and then we'll get back into Second Corinthians. So in a month or so, that we should start four weeks. Yeah. I think that's what we plan two weeks and. Chapter 15 is a super long chapter, and then one in chapter 16, and then we'll, four weeks, we should, we should start on that. But this morning, again, we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and we made it down to about verse 20 last time, and so we'll pick it up there and, and finish up the chapter today. Father, we now come before you in prayer, Lord, asking that you would just, again, move in our hearts and in our midst as we turn to your word and we look to you to... Speak to us and, Lord, teach us and cause us to, to see all that you want us to see. And we know you've preserved this with us in mind for today. It, it, it's perfectly relevant right where we sit today, Father, and we thank you for that. And we ask again that you would do that great work through our hearts and through our midst this morning. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, again, you know, I ask that we could try to put aside old biases and maybe old things that, you know, we have um, 
you know, about the gifts, particularly of tongues that we may have learned growing up and how they're used and how they're maybe not used and this and that. And I know some of us come from, you know, one background or the other. Most didn't really come in the middle because there's not a whole lot of middle ground on this, sadly. I, you know, I like to think that that's one of the great distinctives of Calvary Chapel is that, you know, we don't have, uh, we fall, I think, very biblically, you know, there's no church doctrine that says, you know, on this end that, you know, uh, evidence of you having the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues, right? And then you have these guys way over here that say that, you know, they classify them as sign gifts and they died out with apostles and they don't have any relevance for us today and they dismiss them. Uh, and, you know, the old adage, they throw out the baby with the bathwater. And so, you know, they're violently, I shouldn't say violently, but they're seriously opposed to it. I, you know, so I, I trust me, I read some of those commentators because I really uh, like them because usually on this side, you, you find the best expositional Bible teachers um, over here, but I, there's so much when we come to this that I disagree with them. And they every word they look for to run it down, particularly the gifts of tongues, um, and it's almost reactionary. And then on this side, it's you know it's it's just such an important thing that everybody has to do it, and it has to be in your life, and this and that. And again, I I just think we we or our heart is to touch the the middle ground, or just to stay biblically, and we don't have. We don't bring with us, hopefully, any biases on one side or the other, but rather just are blessed by what we have and the gifts. And um, but we know there's usage, and we know the Bible's clear on it. And this this uh, last portion, um, and really all of chapter 14, just really gives us clear use of two gifts, as we've been talking about, tongues and prophecy in church. And so there's a whole large chapter spent just on those gifts. So it's very clear in scripture. It's not like we get a, a partial scripture here or you know, maybe a sentence here or there or this or that. You know, uh, it, it's, this, These are the things that are very called out very plainly in scripture. And so um, again, that's what we should hold to and not what we've learned or seen or what any particular church denomination has done, um, but rather what does the Bible teach? And so that's where we uh, make our stand. So in speaking about the use and the place of gifts, uh, uh, of the gifts of prophecy in tongues, verse 20 says, Brethren, do not be children in understanding, however in malice be babes, but in understanding be mature. So again, we ended with that last time, but you know, have a deep understanding of the gifts. Again, we talked about that, Paul will say in verse 12, or chapter 12, don't be ignorant about spiritual gifts. It's something we should know. And we should know how they're a blessing and a benefit to the church. And that's why, you know, when I read these guys over here, it's just, you know, the church just misses out on the blessing of all the gifts that the Lord wants to give. There's just nowhere you found, and the gifts are talking about in a number of places, but certainly 1 Corinthians 12, and then, you know, the application of them, or the motive of them, I should say, in chapter 13, and the use of them in chapter 14, you know, they're very clear. And when you just want to separate them, and you separate them into sign gifts, and this kind of gifts, and these kind of gifts, there's just, there's not that division ever found in Scripture. It's just created by those who want to move them aside. And it's just sad because the churches miss out on the blessings and the benefits of the gifts. And uh, it, it just hurts the body, which is sad to me. And, and clearly he's told us, don't stick your head in the sand about these things, right? You, you be mature in your understanding. There's things that you shouldn't understand, and there's good. There's plenty of them out there that you should just be ignorant of, and you don't know how that works or what goes on with that. And I think more of that, the better. And of course, that really flies in the face of what the world thinks, that we should know and ex be exposed to everything. And there's some things we just shouldn't just ever go to and know, and that's fine. But in this, that's not the case. We should not be ignorant. We should know this and be mature in our understanding of these things. And again, you know, some people don't like the controversy, so they want to just, well, yeah, I know these guys believe that, and these guys believe that, and I'm just going to take, you know, hands-off approach and step back, and, you know, whatever they do is fine with me. I'm just, you know, I'm not going to pick sides or do something. That's not what we're told to do. 
we are to know, we are to understand, and, um, and, and we are to use all the gifts. They're, they're supposed to be evident in the church. And there's no place where it says, you know, anything but that. Because they're a blessing to the church. And that's the heart of our Father. That's the heart of our Savior, that we might be blessed. And so uh, we should know these things. So that's why we spend so much time looking at them. Uh, and we give it the, that's one thing, one thing about teaching to the Bible verse by verse. You give the attention to the verses that the Bible gives attention to. If it talks a little bit about a subject, then we just spend a little time on it. If it talks a lot about a subject, we spend a lot of time on it. And that's the great thing about teaching expositionally or going verse by verse, is that we don't overemphasize something, hopefully, <laughs> and we don't underemphasize something because we speak it. Now, you might be kind of tired of hearing about the gifts because we spent quite a bit of time on it, but that's what Scripture's doing. So we need to learn from that. And, you know, some things we go over pretty quickly. Well, that's the attention Scripture gives it. And, um, uh, and that, that's what I think is the great balance of teaching through the Bible. So, again, he reminds them after talking about the gifts earlier, and I'll defer you to listening to last week's message if you want to get caught up on the first 20 verses. But he'll continue on now in verse 21. In the law it is written... With men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people. And yet, for all that, they will not hear me, says the Lord. Therefore, tongues are a sign not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophecy is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. Therefore, if the whole church comes uh, together in one place and all speak with tongues and there come in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, will they not say that you're out of your mind? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, he is convicted by all. And thus the secrets of his heart are revealed. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. So again, we're talking about the uses and the difference of those two gifts, tongues and prophesy. And the first thing he does in verse 21 is quote from Isaiah chapter 28, 11. Now, I find that kind of interesting because the, the verse, when you read Isaiah 28, 11, the context is that God's people, Israel, would not listen to him. They wouldn't listen to the prophets, wouldn't listen to his word. They just wouldn't pay attention and listen to him. So what he did was he said, listen, if you're not going to listen to me, then I'm going to bring in, you know, the prophets that are come speaking in Hebrew and, and, and trying to, you know, bring you back to me and correct, you know, all that's going on there. If you're not going to listen to them, then a correction is going to come another way. I'm going to bring the Assyrians in. And they're going to bark orders at you and you're going to go, huh, what? <laughs> you know, I, I have no idea what you're saying. And, you know, if they're ignoring the prophet and his words, then the Lord is going to allow those people to come in. And so, uh, you know, if you not, don't listen to the simple speech of your own language, then I am going to bring somebody in who you're not going to understand and they're going to correct you in that way. Uh, you know, I like it, you know, um, you, you can learn through the word or you can learn through war, as one person put it, and I like that. So that's the context of the verse he's quoting, right? That's what goes back there. So what in the world does that have to do with the Corinthian church or with us using tongues today or, or prophecy today in the church? And as we read through that, it, it seems like Paul is saying one thing, it's a sign, tongues is a sign to unbelievers, and prophecy is to believers. And then he goes back and says, in the church, uh, tongues is for believers, and prophecy is for unbelievers. So it seems like he's, you know, he's playing both sides of the fence, if you would, or talking out of both things. But I, I, I think as we go through here and see that, we'll, we'll see what he's talking about. And I think it's, it lays it out pretty clear here. And the first part, talking about a sign for unbelievers, let's look at verse 22 again. He says, therefore tongues are a sign, are for a sign, I'm sorry, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophecy is not for unbelievers, but those who believe. So um, 
uh, again, there's a little bit different understanding of this. I, I, J. Vernon McGee, uh, he says this, uh, you know, uh, you know, when I went out into the mission field, let's say Antioch or Peseda, they were speaking a different language. So I spoke to them in their own tongue. And when I presented the gospel to them in their own language, they believed. So what he's saying is that, you know, it's a, it's a sign to unbelievers because you're speaking that language to them, their language, not a heavenly language, but literally their language. And so you speak that out to them in their tongue, if you would, and you have that gift and therefore it's for unbelievers because they will, they will see. And again, um, I, but that's one way of looking at it. And I, I, I think in some ways there's, some, there's certainly some truth there. Because, you know, God does, I believe, miraculously give uh, ability to speak a language, uh, you know, a, a known language to, you know, to missionaries and those that are reaching out and doing those places. I believe that's, that's part of it um, for sure. But really the context of what we're talking about here in, in tongues is, is more that heavenly language that praise uh, we've been talking about it's communication from man to God not from man to man but man man to God and so the while you know what McGee says has some validity I believe uh, it's not really what the context is speaking here um, again um, think back to what the the verse he's quoting in Isaiah in in Isaiah's day you know, God's people had a pretty hard and callous hearts towards the Lord, right? They didn't want to listen to him. They didn't want to, uh, uh, you know, do what he's asking them to do. And again, um, a lot of people think that maybe he's speaking to those who don't believe in the present power of the Holy Spirit, whether in the Corinthian church or in our church today. And they think the 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 gifts, particularly the sign gifts. And again, you know, they'll, they like to delineate that sign gifts and, and separate certain sign gifts uh, and call them sign gifts. And these are, sorry, the name just went out of my head of the other gifts. He calls them uh, that people like that normally uh, refer to them. And the Bible doesn't make that a distinction. But again, you know, uh, that they're not valid for today. And, and so a lot of people think that they're just, they're not valid today. And so just like speaking in the days of Isaiah, you didn't want to hear what the Lord had to say, but he is still going to work. And then when you hear the voice of tongues in the church, it's going to sound very foreign to you because, you know, you've closed the door on tongues. And if you were brought up in a, you know, the Baptist and the conservative and typically the evangelical circles, um, you know, some might define it, you know, tongues wasn't even on the menu. And, um, and if you, if you heard somebody doing that, you'd say, wow, that's, that's pretty wild. That's pretty foreign. And, and so again, um, you know, you know, it seems like he's speaking to them that just don't want to hear and receive those gifts, even back in those days or in today, where, you know, they're not really valid. And so he said, you know, I'm going to continue to do my work, and it may sound foreign to you, but I'm going to do my work regardless of what's going on. And so, you know, I, I think that's, that's pretty clear uh, of what he's talking about here. And also, um, when we look at verse 23, he said, therefore, if the whole church comes together, and I, I kind of look at these other ones, you know, are talking in the sense of, you know, how they're used, not necessarily in the church setting. Because when he says, when the church comes together, then he's going to talk about this, and he, go he goes in the opposite direction. And so again, I think this has application for those not necessarily uh, in the church service. And so that's why there's that distinction between those two. Uh, he he flip-flops from believers uh, not being blessed by tongues and unbelievers, you know, being blessed, and then he goes back the other way when he talks in verse 23. Uh, and again, we know that prophesying will be an, an encouragement to believers, as we said. You know, that's one of the three things that, that prophecy um, will do. And so again, I think, you know, this has some application really outside the church 
And then inside, verse 23 says, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, will they not say that you're out of your mind? But if all prophesy, an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he will be convinced by all, and he is convicted by all. And thus the secrets of his heart are revealed, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among them. So if an unbeliever now comes in the church and hears somebody speaking in tongues, they're going to look at whoever brought them or whatever got them there, and they're going to think, did I go to a, you know, a place where people are like kind of off their rocker? You know, is it kind of, um, is it kind of a crazy thing? I mean, what, it just sounds like they're just babbling crazy things. I don't understand what's going on. And I, I don't know what your first experience was. If you've experienced someone, um, you know, speaking in tongues, I remember the first time I heard it, um, and I was a very new believer and we were praying, we were out witnessing somewhere and I, and we were praying and all of a sudden this guy just kind of breaks out in, in this tongues. And I, you know, was like, what in the world is going on here? And I had this like, this is, is kind of weird. It's, I don't know if I would use the word crazy, but you know, uh, it was very strange. And I had to ask, you know, the person that brought me and the guy that led me to the Lord, you know, what was going on there? And, and I could imagine if I was an unbeliever witnessing that, I felt that way a little bit when I was even a, a new believer. But if I was an unbeliever, I would really think something is kind of wacko there. And again, I, I think most of you have, um, you know, stories when you first heard tongues, how you can, it was very, you know, foreign to you. Somebody had to explain it to you and it seemed pretty, um, you know, different to say the least. But imagine somebody coming in that doesn't know the Lord. Um, how will speaking in tongues impact their lives and turn their hearts to the Lord. Paul said it, it's not. Because again, it's conversation between man and God is the, is the, the real uh, context of, uh, of tongues here in this place, you know, and speaking, you know, uh, uh, to them. And so since they have no relationship this way either, it's just going to seem like nonsense and they won't get anything out of it. But if they hear the word of God and they see the power of the Holy Spirit and, you know, the Holy Spirit moving uh, and bringing them to the Lord, um, they're going to stop and say, wait, something powerful, you know, is really going on here. They may not know exactly what it is, but they know something is going on here. And maybe think of it this way. When you gave your heart to the Lord, um, didn't you feel like, you know, the person speaking was speaking, particularly if you're at a church service, was speaking like directly to you. I mean, you felt like they were, they were up there talking directly to me because it impacted me that way. Wow, he's talking about me. And so when they gave an invitation or, you know, a little bit later on when maybe you prayed with somebody to receive the Lord at, at some point, maybe later on. So, so we know the, the power of that, right? In the church service. And most of us have, have experienced that. And we feel like the Lord is speaking directly to us. And, and it happens even after we're, you know, we're believers. I believe that that happens. Um, it, it certainly can happen in other ways, but I like to think it certainly happens. The gift of prophecy happens when we're doing this, that, you know, the Lord will bring something to my mind, uh, you know, some kind of illustration or, or bring some light out of a of a passage of scripture, you know, whether I'm studying or whether I'm up here and, and, you know, it'll go out and it'll feel like, wow, that's just hitting home, man. You know, is he, you know, is he following me around during the week? You know, did my husband or wife call him and tell him what's going on? I mean, we've all sat through services and thinking that, you know, somebody definitely had to tip off the, 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 the preacher, the pastor, you know, tell us what's going on. And so when it moves in our hearts like that, and, and you know, the unbelievers, you know, can see that because, you know, you're afterwards going, wow, you know, that really impacted me. And then, you know, when they feel it like we did for unbelievers, it's like it's speaking right to us. That has power and that 
has a, a great way of bringing unbelievers to the Lord. You know, he's going to think, wow, the Lord knows all that. Then he knows what's going on. And then you realize you're a sinner, right? That is in verse 25, you're going to fall down and worship God and say, you know, truly, you know, God is among us. And so that's the great power in the church with speaking prophecy that way. You know, there's something powerful going on and they may not understand what it is at the time, but they know it's there. And um, again, you know, how could they know? How could this happen? It must be God. And so tongues doesn't have much impact on them. As a matter of fact, it might even turn some of them away uh, in the church. But prophecy will move in power in the unbelievers. And so now Paul will address what's going on in the Corinthian services and what should happen. And so he says here in verse 26, How is it then, brethren, when you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or three three at uh, most, I'm sorry, two or at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. But if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent." And so now he's really going on to, you know, what's going on in the Corinthian church here. Um, he kind of says in verse 26, how is it when you guys get together, you know, somebody's, you know, uh, you know, speaking in a song or singing a song or reading a psalm like Carl did this morning, and then somebody else is trying to teach, somebody's speaking in a tongue, somebody's speaking a revelation or a prophecy, somebody's, you know, interpreting something, and... You know, it seems like in the Corinthian church, everything was happening all at once. Now, I don't know about you, but, you know, um, Thomas was sharing this morning that, you know, the pastor of Twin Lakes was off for three months, and one of the things he did was he went to a different church, I think he said, every yeah, every weekend. And I think that's that has some great, you know, and wonderful you know, things. I, I've been to multiple churches through my life, and, um, you know, it's great, you know, even sitting through a Catholic service, uh, a Mass, uh, once in a while, I have done that uh, for various reasons. And, you know, again, it's, um, you know, uh, I, I think it has some great benefit. And if some of you have done that, and you've been to a very Pentecostal church, you know exactly what he's talking about here because it's like, woo, you know, there is stuff going on and that person's doing that and that person's, you know, doing this and the worship team is, you know, singing this and, uh, you know, the preacher's saying that and it's just going on. And I, I had a friend that lived next to a very Pentecostal church. And it happened to be a, a black Pentecostal church next door. And I think once a month they'd have like Revival Sunday, and it would go on for like six hours. And they weren't quiet. <laughs> you could literally, I mean, because it was like next door, literally, and uh, you could hear everything that was going on inside there. And, you know, you sit there and listen, and I even sat in there a few times, but it, it, was, it was kind of what, I, I kind of picture that when I read this right here, y you know? Um, and it's just so much going on at once. And what he's saying here, so if one person sings a song, everyone's trying to teach, someone's trying to speak a revelation, a tongue, interpretation, you know, none of those things are wrong, right? And those things can and do have a wonderful impact on the church. And they're certainly, as we'll see and have seen, it's a great benefit for the church. But notice what it says in the very last sentence of chapter 26, let all things be done for edification. So in other words, those things that happen that way must be done for the common good. And, and it, there shouldn't be mayhem in the services. And, and 
what happens, and if you've been around those churches where those things are happening like that, you, you, you know how easy it is for spiritual pride to creep in. You know, to be spiritual in the church, you know, you, you have to be one of those people that, that's speaking in tongues or interpreting or saying a prophecy or doing this. And if you're not one of those, then quite frankly, you're not looked on as being very spiritual or certainly not very spiritual mature. And so it, it, it lays the groundwork for spiritual pride to certainly creep, creep in there. And he says, listen, um, what you do should edify everybody. And you need to check your motives, you know, should be checked for why you're using the gifts. And it shouldn't be for any other reason. And, you know, he talked about that very clearly in 1 Corinthians 13. You know, your motives are important in the use of the gifts. If there's not love, then they're really useless. Tongues is like banging on a, a pot with a wooden spoon, you know, for a little toddler, as we talked about. It's just a sound and a noise without love. And he's just reminding him here that, you know, it's all got to be for the common good. Don't forget that. He's not saying don't do any of those things, but your heart has to be for the common good. And now he's going to clearly define how the use of tongues should happen in the church. So they got all this going on. All this is happening at once. And he said, okay, you know, uh, you have all that going on, but you got to check your motives. Make sure spiritual pride is not is not getting in there and you you know you have to speak out because everybody else is doing it and you know as one person you know told me i've said this before a number of times but you know we were working down at a local church here and helping out with a play i remember one of the elders said to me you know and i we've been going there for about a year helping them out sunday afternoons and um you know he said we're going to get you to speak in tongues by the time this is done and, you know, of course, my answer was, how do you know I don't speak in tongues? And it, you know, <laughs> kind of shook him because he thought for sure I was, you know, one of these on this side that, that d did that. And, and again, it's just important that we check our motives and it, you don't do it because everybody else is doing it or everybody expects you to do it or you have to do it. You know, it's got to be for everybody's benefit. And this is how it tongue should happen in the church. So as I read just a minute ago, verse 27, if anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or three, uh, at most, I'm sorry, <laughs> if anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Now, it seems so clear, right? I, I, you know, it, it's just very clear. And what blows my mind is how many, uh, you know, real Pentecostal church just choose to ignore this. Um, and if you've ever talked to anybody about this that, that participates in one of those very charismatic churches, and you say, wow, there's, you know, there's 25 or 30 or 50 people speaking in a tongue within an hour hour and a half, two hour service or something like that, whatever it is. And if you question that, they're, generally their response is, who are you to quench the Holy Spirit, <laughs> right? You know, we just have to let it out. W what do you mean two or three at the most? How could, how could we quench the Holy Spirit? How can we not just let it out? You know, the Holy Spirit's putting in our heart. We have to say it out. And of course, we'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, you know, the, the control issues. Um, and, and some will just say that. We, we just have to let it out and you can't quench the Holy Spirit. Or others will say, you know, yes, tongues are being spoken and there seems like more because, well, it's not really tongues. It's just they're praying in tongues. And so, therefore, there's more use of, of, of tongues than what Scripture you know, talks about because it's not really tongues, it's just a really praying in tongues, which of course there's no distinction in scripture, which is unscriptural because it doesn't, dis, dis, there's no distinction in that way. And so pretty clearly he says, listen, two or three people at the most with an interpretation and uh, and and that's that's it. it. It shouldn't just keep going on and on. And you know, sister, you know, uh, Sarah speaks in a tongue, and then brother 
Jimmy speaks in a tongue and then sister this and then brother that and it goes, you know, around like this, uh, you know, through the church service, you know, or in different times. Um, and, and it shouldn't be that way. And when a person does speak in tongues, there has to be an interpretation. And if there is nobody to interpret it, then shut the yapper. It's pretty clearly there's nobody has the gift of interpretation of tongues. And, and there again, it's a communication between God and, and man and God. And so you just keep that line open. He's not saying don't do it, but you just keep it between you and God. <laughs> That's it. There's no interpretation, so it has no public church benefit for anybody, but it has benefit for you. And sure, you continue to do it. Nobody's you know, uh, restricting that. But when it's spoken out loud in the church and nobody's interpreting, then... It, there's no place for it in the church because we talked about that in lot chapter 12 and if you want to go back and review that but again it just it, it's it's no benefit to the church at all and how can somebody say amen when they have no idea what's being said that's what Paul will say in chapter 12 but it's pretty clear here you know it's pretty clear it, well I shouldn't say pretty clear it's very clear how, how the gifts should should work in church and again, as I said, a number of times we we're teaching through, it seems like the Corinthian church, you know, had a very strong use or a very high use of the gift of tongues. And that's why it's being focused on so much. And prophecy wasn't considered as, as spiritual or as good as tongues. And they've had this lopsided view. And Paul's trying to bring it back into, you know, uh, what, the godly way of how the church should run and so he talks about tongues and now he's going to talk about prophecy in the church verse 29 says let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge but if anyone uh i'm sorry but if anything is revealed to another who sits by let the first keep silence so again, you know, the word of God, the same thing as kind of tongues, two or three of them during service. It shouldn't be going on and on and on and on a number of times there, um, you know. And when they speak it, you hear what they say and you make sure it lines up with the word of God and what prophecies are. And remember, we talked about that a little bit earlier on. He made it very clear in, the, in, in chapter um, uh at the beginning of chapter 12 that we looked about, uh, about you know, it's for edification, encouragement, and comfort. That's what prophecy is. Edification, encouragement, and comfort. If someone stands up and says, thus says the Lord, and, you know, we need to stop that, you know, sin, and we need to, you know, write letters to, you know, to stop, Stop abortion clinics or something like that. I, I don't know. I'm, you know, I'm just kind of throwing something off the top of my head. Uh, um, you know, well, first of all, everybody should judge, right? Let others judge. Okay, is it bringing encouragement? Is it, you know, like, hey, you can do it. Yeah, keep going, you know, trust the Lord. And, you know, is it bringing um, edification, you know, like clarity to this and doing this or comfort to somebody? Well, yeah, it's doing that or it's not doing that. And so you judge and sit back and, you know, say, okay, that's not a prophecy because that's not bringing one of those three, one of those three into light. And uh, so he, he makes it clear that everybody looks at it. You just don't say, because somebody says, thus says the Lord, that all of a sudden everybody goes, okay, that's it. You know, the Lord's speaking and whatever he says, that's it. And, you know... If you lived as a Christian through the 90s, um, you know, this was a real big thing going on. Uh, the gifts were really big, particularly in the vineyard movements. There was vineyard churches all over, and they were really a break off from Calvary Chapel uh, early on in, I would say, in the 80s. And they really were on the very Pentecostal side with gifts of tongues and prophecy and all those things. And you know, what happened is, you know, prophecy became such a big and important part of everything that it became, it overshadowed everything else. People were always looking for, 
you know, if somebody had the gift of prophecy, then, you know, they would be seeking after these prophecies and the attention to the Word of God and, and a lot of other things just kind of fell to the back because it was so important to, to you know, hear these prophecies and that's what kept you going. And, um, and again, it just became lopsided. And of course, the gift of tongues moved on to all sorts of stuff. Pretty soon they were barking like animals and dogs and they would sit, and I, I went to the main vineyard church because it was 20 minutes from my house. And I went there a couple of times just to really see if that was going on, um, you know, as I heard it was going on. And there was people, you know, barking like a dog and people down all fours and, and they were, everybody was excited about it saying, wow, that's the gift of tongues and God, you know, it was just, it, it went, it, maybe madness is kind of a, <laughs> a, a, a harsh word, but it just drifted off so far. Um, and y- y- you know, that's what can happen. And, and, you know, Paul's making it very clear, uh, the heart of the Lord in these things. And if one person is standing up and is speaking that, and another person, um, you know, has a revelation from the Lord, then actually the first person is supposed to stop. You be quiet. Let this person go. But we also know that God doesn't interrupt Himself, and He doesn't contradict Himself. So there must be discernment, and there must be order in the service, as He'll say at the last verse and verse forty of the chapter as we get to it. So when you're speaking a prophecy, it's got to be a prophecy. He made it very clear what a prophecy is, those three things. And that everybody, or well, not everybody, but those, as we'll talk about in a minute, the leaders are to judge that, is it from the Lord? And we know the Lord will never contradict himself and he doesn't interrupt himself. So it's, it's not going to ever uh, not align with what he's revealed in scripture. Um, you know, it's not going to contradict that to say the least. So, why are these things important? Well, verse 31 says, For you can all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be encouraged. So, you know, when there is order, and it's just not this crazy randomness, and it's going on, and there's really no opportunity, maybe even for worship, and giving of the word, and the teaching going out, and you just have all these things and all these interruptions, you know, um, he, he said, you know, it shouldn't be that way. It's just kind of one uh, by one and, and then so that everybody is blessed. And again, the point, the whole point of the gifts in the church is so that everyone is blessed. You're thinking of the good of everyone. And it's not judging everyone because if somebody says, well, thus says the Lord, you know, this church is in sin and there's, you know, people going in sin and they need to repent from that because it's bringing down the church or this or that. That's not from the Lord. That's not prophecy. Uh, That's judging everybody. And again, prophecy will bring encouragement to a church. So it has a very important place. And again, it makes me sad and for when churches or denominations want to do away with it. They want to do away with this deep, heavenly language communication between man and God and when they want to do away with when God wants to speak prophetically to encourage the body of Christ that it doesn't have a place anymore we have the word of God you know we we look back in those days through the mirror dimly but now we see clearly and they said that's the coming of the word of God which of course is not at all the context of what's being said there Um, and and so it's done away with And, and it's sad because people that dismiss them Again, as I said earlier, the, the congregations lose out, and, and it's sad to me. Well, verse 32 gives us the, uh, well, the next few verses, I should say, give us these overarching principles for the gifts and what we need to, to know. So when the gifts are being used in the church, and particularly during the church service, verse 32 says, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to, to the prophets. And if you're one of those underlinable or highlighter persons in your Bible, I think uh, this is a, a clear point that he says, nobody should think that they can't control themselves. They can. That's what he's saying here. The, 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 the spirit that's coming into you, the Holy Spirit, as he's using you, is not like what well, people say, well, how can I hold it in? You know, that's got to come out. You know, the Holy Spirit 
hit me and it, it's just got to come out and who can stop that and who do you think you are by saying it it, 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 it shouldn't go on uh, just because there's no interpretation or just because you know six other people have already you know said a prophecy and you know, I, I have to speak it out or I, I spoke in a tongue or this or that and he says pretty clearly that you know uh, or very clearly that nobody should think they can't control themselves they can and, and no person can say well I have no control over this this is what the Holy Spirit Holy Spirit is doing who can stop the Holy Spirit well we can we can the Lord gives us control over this you know um, we, we need to know that it's, it's just like anything else the Lord doesn't force us to do anything he has chose to give us free will um, I, I believe way back when God created man in his own image I, I, I believe one of the important components of making man in his own image was giving us the choice of free will and we are free to do and he allows us to do what we decide to do he gives us that free will and because he's given us that in everything you know you can choose to you know follow the lord you can choose to sin you, you know what it is we all have those choices and they happen so many times during the day and how could all of a sudden you know, the use of some of the gifts say, no, I, I, I'm, I'm left out of the choice. You know, I, I'm, I'm not in control. He's not giving me the option to do it or not do it. It just, you know, it, it just runs contrary to everything we know in Scripture. You know, and, and for some people, it's a step of faith to, to do that. You know, they're very shy to, to speak out in a, in, a, in a church body would just about kill them, <laughs> you know? They don't want to speak out. They don't want to be heard. And so, you know, for them, it, in the Lord moving them, it's a step of faith for them. Or for others, you know, we think we're so used to being heard and everything, it, it, it's, it, it's a step of faith for just to keep our mouth closed. It, it's just um, something that we control. Just know that. We have free will in everything, whether we use the gifts or not use the gifts. And, you know, if, let's say three prophecies are going on or three tongues have happened and you're there in the church and you feel like, you know, the Lord uh, is, is telling you to speak out, well, having a fourth is not a great sin or anything like that. But maybe a person ought to sit back and say, okay, you know, maybe this one's for me, Lord. Maybe this isn't meant for everybody. This, this prophecy, this encouragement, this edification, this comfort, or this... Uh, you know, tongue that I'm going to speak is just between, it's just for me. And it's okay for people to sit back and think, you know, okay, you know, having another one or five or six is not some great sin, but everybody should start thinking at some point, okay, Lord, is this really what you want me to share with everybody or is this just really for me? And we have that ability to do that. And so the whole thing uh, of you know the preacher couldn't preach because the spirit was flowing <laughs> and I don't know if you've ever heard of that but um, down south I don't even know if, how much Trinity Broadcasting Network is up here but uh, Channel 40 it used to be down there um, you know I, I can't tell you how many pastors have been on that show that I watch I you know sometimes I can only watch so much it would just you know get my blood boiling a little bit but I, I remember hearing that a number of times well Man, the spirit was flowing. A preacher couldn't preach because, you know, the spirit was flowing. You know, I couldn't even say anything. And that's just, it's not biblical. It's not biblical. Um, and so we need to know that. The spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. And then he says this in verse 34. And again, these overarching principles for the use of these gifts. Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for women to speak in church. Can I have an amen, men? And we just move on from that? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Now, this might seem out of the blue, and this is very random. And Paul, where did this come from, right? You know? Well, let's make sure 
we understand the context because we just spent a few weeks ago in chapter 11, remember we were talking about the, the head coverings and how that was important in the Corinthian church because it was a sign that you, know, that you weren't you know, a, a prostitute, that you, you, know, you were married. And, and I kind of likened it to wedding bands and wedding rings. You know, it was a sign in that society for that. And, and, and it, you know, he would go on and say in chapter 11 that if a woman you know, prays or prophesies with her head uncovered, it, it wouldn't be good. People wouldn't receive it. So obviously, people praying and prophesying in the church was certainly allowed and certainly going on because he even talked about that in the, in the context of head coverings. So we know it's not that. You know, it's not some macho thing uh, where they don't have any value in, in church. But what it applies to, and again, think of what we're talking about here. We're talking about prophecies, right? The immediate context of evaluating a prophetic message, right? Um, again, two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. And, and then, so we're talking about prophetic messages here. That's what he's, that's the, the immediate context. And, and again, uh, the Majority responsibility for doctrine purity in the church rested on the shoulders of elders and, and the men in the church. You know, 1 Timothy 2 uh, says that very clearly. And uh, again, so what was apparently happening here and the context of this prohibition was that there are some women seemingly like, okay, that, that responsibility, is it, is it right? Uh, is what they're saying biblical? Does it line up with a, what a prophetic message is? You know, that was left to the leadership of the church, which God clearly has said in Scripture, and I know a lot of churches, not a lot, but there are churches that certainly have moved on from that, and they have all kinds of reasons why it's not applicable today. But again, it's just like the gifts, they're, they're not done away with back sometime, and, you know, we have the new modern thinking. I, I think that's still very clear uh, and there's a number of reasons for that, and I won't get into all that right now. But, but again, in evaluating the prophetic message, she, she, it's, it's not her responsibility to do that. Now, if it's a women's meeting and there's only women there, and then those in leadership obviously you know, are going to be doing that. Uh, so we're, we're talking about in the, the general church services at, at, as a whole, right? And like verse 34 says. And again, um, the idea is if somebody says a prophecy and then there's some discussion about it, um, they don't want any extra controversy by them asking questions. Okay, well, you know, the, the, maybe the elders are kind of talking amongst themselves about what was just said and, and uh, you know, and then, you know, a gal would speak out and say, well, what about this and this and this? And he said, listen, it's not, it's not meant, um, you know, to, to make this big uh creation of problems or even perhaps, you know, generating arguments. Um, again, um, so allowing the prophecy to be said and render judgment, you know, is it scriptural? And again, should they, um, th th it, it, it could be a very confusing mess now when other people are coming in, particular women, and then, okay, what does that mean? And he said, listen, it's great to, to understand and discuss that whole thing, what happened and what was said and why we said it wasn't a prophecy or it was a great prophecy. And you guys have plenty of time to discuss that, not during the church service, but when you're at home. And you just don't want to add, if you would, to the chaos. And again, then the, the debate becomes the focus of the church service rather than the message or the, or the prophecy that was, you know, that was spoken here. Uh, so again, I think the context speaks and refers to either, you know, judging the prophecy, which is something, you know, for the leadership to do, or, you know, this disruptive speaking. We just want to make it all very clear that, you know, we, we stay with what the Lord's doing and how the Holy Spirit's moving and that everything that should happen in the church should happen. And we shouldn't create all this added controversy and questions and time down that way and it's better to discuss that outside of church well it's important imperative that it's discussed outside of church not certainly during the service and so uh, i believe very clearly that's what he's talking about because that is in the context of what we were just discussing all right well he's winding everything up with this and let's finish up this verse 36 
Or did the word of God come originally from you? Or was it you only that it reached? If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. But if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. Therefore, brethren, earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid to speak with tongues. Now, again, I just can't think it, it, it's any more clear than this and how people can dismiss the things written in this chapter. Um, Paul knows that there are going to be some of those who are not going to like these instructions that he's given uh, to the church. And he's going to say, those that are really spiritual in your body are going to acknowledge this is the word of God and this is coming from the Lord. This is, this is from, him, from the Lord. This is not from me and not my opinion, not my idea, not what I thought of, not how I think the church should be putting together. This is from the Lord. And I know some people aren't going to like it, and, uh, you know, uh, but those who are spiritual are going to acknowledge when they seek the Lord, when they read this letter, when they're talking about these things, you know, the Holy Spirit's going to speak to them and certainly confirm it all because it is from the Lord and it is the word of God. And again, um, you know, if a person doesn't want to hear it and they choose to be ignorant about it, well, then that's what they choose to do. Uh, but that's on them. But the, the really spiritual in the church will see this is uh, the word of God. And, and again, um, you know, desire to prophesy. We talked about that, why it was good. And, and then he says, don't forbid to speak in tongues. And, and it just blows my mind, you know, how churches can go to one end or the other, which I talked about in the beginning. It can be so extreme that you know, tongues and prophesy and all these signs just take over the service and others just, you know, completely ignore it. And, and, and clearly scripture is saying very, you have to really dig up all kinds of very thin arguments, to say the least, to, to, to be in those camps. Don't forbid to speak in tongues. How do you get around that? You know, how do you, well, you have to work a bunch of stuff and move it around this way and, and get it in that way to make it make sense to somebody. And, and doing it so much that it takes over everything, well, you have to do the same thing. You have to go these convoluted ways to get to, you know, uh, you know why you do those things. But just don't forget the whole thing. God hasn't. Um, you know, they're important. And though there's scattered opinions everywhere, the Word of God is very clear. And he finishes it up with this, verse 40, let all things be done decently and in order. So the church service should have this about them. You know, quite frankly, not swinging from the chandeliers and, and going crazy um, and letting everything just kind of run wild, uh, like I spoke about, you know, the story of the vineyard churches, you know, where you just kind of let supposedly the moving of the Holy Spirit go and go and go. Next thing you're, you're barking like dogs, you're, you know, uh, they run around. One person was running around uh, like a leopard. I'm a leopard, and the Holy Spirit's, you know, flo I mean, it, I, I can't tell you the stuff that I saw there. And then it starts going in that direction, and pretty soon it's just, you know, uh, it's just mayhem. That person's doing this, this person's doing that. And, and, you know, it would definitely not line up with all things being done decently and in order. You know, our God is a God of order. Our God is a God that, you know, things are, are, are done in order and they're decently. He doesn't conflict with each other. He doesn't talk over one another. He doesn't, you know, talk to this person, this person at the same time. So there's two people talking. It's just, he doesn't interrupt himself. He doesn't do that. And he's not so, you know, opposed to all the things of going on in the church and the gifts. And there's just no way that can be spiritual. And, you know, and, the, and the, the, the people on that side just lose all the blessings and really break what Scripture says. Forbidding those things when it clearly says, don't forbid. And then when the Scripture, can you say that they're done away with? It's, it's just not there. You have to really work at it. And so it should be done, and it should be decent and in order, as he has said here. Well, 
we conclude here with that verse, and next time we'll go on with chapter 15, really talking about uh, the resurrection, and uh, it's, we change the subjects completely for the rest of the, the chapter in the book here. So let's go before the Lord. Father, we come before you now, Lord, and just in thanksgiving that you give us clear instruction on these things. And I know um, it was a lot. You know, we spent quite a few weeks looking at these things, and, but that's what you did. And because you wanted clear instruction, even back in the very beginning of the church, uh, these controversies were going on. And so it's nothing new. All this uh, that we're reading about here is just nothing new. They're still happening today. And it's just sad that it is because it's just not what your intent was. And you tried to lay down very early on clearly what your church services that you have should look like. You, you made it clear not to prohibit certain things, and not to go so far beyond them. The things would be done decently in order. And it just seems like we just never learn those lessons. And I'm sorry for that, Lord. We're, we're, we're sorry. We come humbly and, and apologize for the attitude we have in the church of lining up on one side or the other and not lining up with you. And uh, help us to be those people that do. We, we want to be in the center of your will. We want you to be well pleased in our church services and not serve a denomination or people's opinion or what you know a group of people or denominations have formed in, in the sense of doctrines around these things and, and all, all denominations have. And they drew lines in the sand that you never intended to have. And it's just sad because people don't get to hear the word clearly and all that you want to do in the service that just run off with them and and the people that dismiss them wholly miss out on on the blessings that could be theirs as well and it's it, it's sad lord and it breaks our heart and we ask that you would just work in those situations and certainly work in our lives lord we we want to be lined up with you and you be well pleased in everything we do in, in the church service father so lead us and guide us and continue to reveal your will to us and through your word as you're so faithful to do and by your spirit, Lord, that we might always be in tune with you. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen, Amen. Amen you guys. Thanks, sir. Thanks for hanging in there and we'll pick it up with resurrection Yay. next Yay. time.